Good morning. It is the start of my much-needed mental health day. I set no alarm and I slept until 6.15. Crazy. I did some stuff around the house. I checked the drone footage from yesterday that was okay. It's what happens when you don't plan a flight or plan your shots. It's very like haphazard and all over the place. I'm sure there's something usable in there that they'd like to see. Well, hello everybody. It is 9 o'clock and I'm headed to therapy. Friday therapy, but it's in the morning. It's weird. Like, like I, I usually go at the end of the day when I have a whole bunch of experiences. And the truth is I haven't really talked to anybody today. Like, like literally physically spoken. The only person I've spoken to has been you in the early video. And it's fun. like, some days it takes, it takes a while. It takes practice to get, to sort of get your expressive juices flowing. You know what I mean? And because I'm a little neurotic, I was worried that we'd have nothing to talk about. Not nothing, but that I wouldn't talk about things that were important to me. Or I would forget significant things that happened during the week, and then I'd be like, oh damn, I wanted to talk to her about whatever. So I went through video from the past week. I sort of watched the gameplay footage of the week to take notes on to be like, oh yeah, that's right, I need to talk to her about this or that or this or that. So I have notes in my pocket that I took based on watching me reporting on my life. This whole thing is getting a little weird. It's whatever gets you through, right? So, uh, this is what's gonna get me through, I hope. I mean, I, I love my barn friends, I really do. I'm, I'm grateful on so many levels. Yeah, I'm curious about some of the stuff I wanna talk about today. Things such as, you know, when I went out to Panera with, the, with my two barn friends and they kind of made fun of me. I don't wanna say ruthlessly, but maybe mercilessly. And what that felt like, like, the fact that it didn't kill me. The fact that I'm either getting stronger or empathetically realizing that they don't have the perspective to understand how they could be hurting me. <laughs> but either way, it didn't wreck me. Yeah, and it'd just be good to see her. Like, I, I like her, I like hanging out. So it's kind of like starting the day with dessert first again. There's other less pleasant things I have to do, but getting to go to therapy to start the day is awesome. I do miss going to work. I feel, I feel like I'm doing something wrong, even though I'm doing something to make me well. I feel like I'm cheating a little bit. To know they're over there doing work, doing school, and I'm here going to the doctor, basically. I feel like I'm being sneaky. I don't like being sneaky, I like being transparent. I need to get me taken care of. I need to get the car and my life taken care of. I would have taken a personal day if I had known all these things in enough time. I just didn't. Why am I talking? Okay, I will see you later. Have a great day. That was really fantastic. It had a totally different energy to it. And maybe it was just because of the time of day. Because we met at 9.15 in the morning as opposed to three o'clock or four o'clock, everybody brought a different energy to the situation. I had my list of things and we, we went down the list and I think made a lot of sense of things. You know, what came up today was, was the whole metaphor of the 15 stones in Kyoto and how the garden is set up so you can only see 14 at any time. So you have to move or you have to change your vantage point to see the one that you can't see. She used that metaphor when I was talking about having having a particularly strong opinion of something at one point and basically doubt later. And, and the case being, oh, me talking about, about these videos in particular, that, that when I started making them, I was 100% confident that I was gonna publish them and they're fantastic, which I still think is true. But now being nervous about, about publishing them and, and not, not being 100% sure if I should and if it'll impact my life professionally and what could come of it. I really do like that metaphor of, I mean, it basically ties into what I always say of, you don't know what you don't know. I didn't know then what I'd know now, which is not some, some great truth so much as just how my perspective has shifted. And my perspective isn't that I shouldn't publish the videos. I'm just not 100% confident, but I still, I still like them. I still think it's good. So it's, it, you know, it's a curious fight. I talked about going to Panera with my friends and how they were, what, what I talked about on the way up, I talked about that. And she thought that was kind of marvelous, that that is how teens show love and inclusion. You know, they make fun of each other. They, you know, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not to push each other down. It's just, it's a, it's a means of expression or form of expression. And I definitely agree with that. I love the rock garden metaphor. I love the idea that you have to move to get perspective, to see the thing you couldn't see. 
as she was talking about it, I, I couldn't help but keep thinking about if in that garden you can only ever see 14 out of the 15 at once. If you move to see that other stone, you're gonna lose one. So you know all the stones are there. If you if you've had a perspective for a while, you're very very you know all the stones you can see well. So does it fit into the metaphor that can you move willfully to see the new stone and obscure one of the other stones? And but I don't think that's necessarily the intention of the metaphor. I do I do like that idea. It is an act of will, and I feel like that that even better encapsulates what I've been trying to do. Risk taking such as, you know, publishing these videos that is a blind but hopefully somewhat calculated risk. She asked if I could put words to, to, to my version of the metaphor with obscuring one of the stones, and the metaphor I used for that was, was about that really great lesson I had where we were all laughing. In the midst of that lesson, uh, it still chokes me up. I'm still pretty broken. In the midst of that lesson, where we were laughing and we were happy and I was in one of the best places I've been in. In the midst of that, my wife's boyfriend came walking by. But my focus was on the people who make me happy. The people who make me feel cared about. And I was able to deprioritize his presence and keep my focus on the really meaningful things. And that felt, that felt really significant. And I think she agreed with me. Like, I, th I think that was an apropos metaphor. I'm thrilled that that's done. In the midst of all that, there was an email from my attorney saying that it's been taking him a while to write this email back to me and maybe a phone call would be better. Is there a time that's good today? So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wide open anytime. So I'm just waiting for him now. He gave me a little bit of hope. He said he already spoke with my wife's attorney, the mediator giving her an attorney reference. Isn't that big of an issue? It still bothers me though. And he indicated that those Watts and Epstein charges and credits are probably a non-issue. So things are, things are getting hammered out. I can't really move anything to the new house because I haven't agreed with my wife who gets what. And while we're in escrow, we're not secure enough to unstage the house. I'm starting to think about what happens when I don't need therapy anymore. What happens when I'm okay enough where I feel like this is a lot of money. I mean, on the one hand, yay. But on the other hand, I really like her. <laughs> it would be sad to be like, well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Now, on the other hand, I want to be like, hey, can we be friends? But that might be awkward. Like, it'd be awkward to do that and have her be like, no. Like, I'm your therapist. It doesn't know. While I was getting ready to go, a whole series of emails came in from different people. My attorney is going to try and call me at 1.45, which will be in 15 minutes. And I thought, should I wait around the house for the phone call? And I thought, no, well, no, what if it gets delayed? Like, I have things I need to do. So, I'm ready. I got my phone set up. I got my headset in. When he calls, I'll be ready. And then an email came in from my wife, response to my spreadsheet. So she responded quickly. It was a pretty civil email about the division of stuff. She's a little mistaken about some things in terms of things she thought she owned before we got together. But I don't honestly know how much I feel like fighting that. Like she thinks this bookshelf, this Crate and Barrel bookshelf, she had before we got together. She didn't. I remember taking a picture of the sunset at Crate and Barrel the night we went to pick it up. I remember how it was so long that I drove and she had to sit in the seat behind me so it could span all the way over here. I know this for a fact, but it's, it's one of those things like, how much is it worth it to fight her on things or to, to fight her on this one? I like the bookshelf a lot. If she takes it, I will buy another one because I really like the bookshelf. I haven't actually looked at the spreadsheet. These were just explanations she gave in the body of the email. She said she will give me the engagement ring back, but she'd like the wedding ring since she bought it. And the truth is, we bought it. I mean, that's fine. It's just weird. This is hard because on an emotional level, having her say, I'm giving you the engagement ring back feels like, like a, a cross between a smack in the face and a stab in the heart. It hurts. She doesn't want it. She claimed, she claimed to love it more than anything. She loved it so much. It was so beautiful. And she's like, yeah, you can have it back. 
which is confusing to me, but okay. If she had wanted to keep it, I would have been like, oh, sure, she kept the, the engagement ring. So I guess that's fair, but then it begs, so what do I do? What do you do with, with a Tiffany's engagement ring? And I'm sure I can find, that sucks. You know, do you, what are your options? You can put it in a box somewhere with the relics of your wedding. You could, what, go to a pawn shop? I don't think I'd want to do that. That it just feels disrespectful to the, to the marriage, to the legacy of what we had. And maybe I'm hung up on that and I should let it go. I don't really know. At the first thought of that, it makes me feel sad. So I will, she will take her wedding ring and I will be left with the engagement ring and my wedding ring. Okay. It's hard, right? There's no point in keeping it because I, I firmly and absolutely believe we will never be anything again. So then what? There's no use in keeping it if I don't believe in us. There's this tone of civility in the email that I'm not enjoying. And that probably sounds dumb, but nothing about this has felt civil. This has been a really unpleasant separation and divorce process. And now all of a sudden when we're talking about our thing, it's respectful and considerate. She said she's willing to, in regards to the plates. She said she doesn't really care which set of plates she gets. She was giving me the everyday plates because they're white and she knows I like serving food on white plates. And it's true. I do like a simple presentation that focuses on the food. It's a yucky feeling to not know what to believe anymore, to not believe her anymore. To read this email that seems to have thoughtfulness and kindness in it and think, why? Why are you being nice now? And that sucks. It's so counter to who I am. I want to believe in the goodness of people, but there's just too much evidence to the contrary here. It's really unfortunate that it has to be like this, but this is a situation she created. I feel nerves right now for my talk with the attorney. Nerves and excitement. I haven't talked to him in a while. I'm just excited to hear what he has to say about things, what he thinks about the mediator suggesting an attorney, what he thinks about a five-way mediation, what he thinks the future looks like, what he thinks I should do with the quick claim. I'm hoping coming off this call, I will have answers that make me feel like, okay, I have more of a direction. My wife's boyfriend came walking by. I see him and I still get a little bit of that adrenaline kick where I'm like, oh, it's him. But there's also a little bit of it like an, ugh, it's him. The fact that he exists in the world doesn't wreck me as much anymore. It just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Oh, before that, as I was getting to the barn, my attorney called. That was good, that was a short phone call, which is good for me having to pay for it standpoint. I mean, I think it was a 13 minute phone call, so it's still like money. But it put my mind to ease about a, a few things. The fact that the mediator gave her a legal reference he didn't think was the most inappropriate thing because he expressed the same sentiments as her in terms of my wife could have gone and gotten like a really nasty attorney. I trust my attorney. Anything that happens from here forward, I trust him. I will do as he suggests. In regards to the quit claim thing, he's gonna look over the stipulation and we'll have something for Monday. So I can sign that thing next week, I guess because I, I don't really much care. I'm delighted she's going. The main thing they dis disagree about is the, the spousal support thing. Everything else he and the other attorney agree on. Apparently they had a phone call where it sounds to me like it was two guys on the phone like, all right, let's just get this thing done. What do we have to do? What he said that, that I enjoyed was that they both had pretty significant legal careers. He said, we've both represented her before. We, we know how this goes. We, need, we know what needs to get done to get it settled. And that made me feel good because it's like, this isn't a novel thing. It's, it's commonplace. We're all fitting character types, probably. She's the high earner that doesn't want to pay. I'm the nice guy who got screwed over. You know, it, if we were characters in a movie, you'd probably be like, ugh, the, you know, these characters. But in this instance, I'm okay with it because Hopefully it, it means the path towards resolving this issue isn't isn't complicated. It's, it's a pretty clear thing to do. Like, I don't think we're going to break new ground or I don't think something's going to come out where anybody's like, oh, we never considered this before. It's simple. She cheated, left, doesn't want to pay me. I'm heartbroken and sad and just want what I deserve. She will probably have to pay more than she wants. I will probably get less than I deserve. Neither of us will be happy and it will be done. If I had to predict the future, that's probably what will happen. Lawyers for both of us will cost more than either of us want to pay. Yep, that's probably part of the story too, it always is. She'll be pissed because of this 
and I'll be somewhat unhappy because of this. Ultimately, I'll be fine, and she will hold on to the pissedness forever and probably weave it into a bigger tale that makes me more of a greedy villain, and that'll just have to be okay. As we get more distance from this, I will get more and more fine. The sizzle and the sting and the hurt of it all will become more dull. It will always be present, but it'll become more dull. And then at some point, hopefully, I will meet somebody who's good for me, who's real, you know, who's a genuine, loving person. And then this will get pushed way, way back into stories from my past. It didn't have to, but she did this. She did all of this.